Good morning, everyone. My name is Salman Keshavji, and I am a professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of the Harvard Medical School Center for Global Health Delivery. It's a great honor for our center to co-host this important set of meetings, one of which is going to be about upper room UV germicidal lighting and the importance of the engineering controls in conjunction with ventilation to keep public spaces safe during and after the COVID-19 outbreak. I want to begin by thanking our co-hosts, the Harvard Global Health Institute, the Middle East Initiative at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government, and our close partners at Advanced Access and Delivery, a nonprofit committed to equity and healthcare delivery. The mission of Harvard Medical School is to nurture a diverse, inclusive community dedicated to alleviating suffering and improving health and well being. And at the Center for Global Health Delivery, we contribute to this mission through a focus on the last phase of healthcare delivery, figuring out how the fruits of modern medicine can reach people in the communities where they live and work. And for many years now, our center and most of our faculty have been working to stop the spread of TB, tuberculosis, a disease that has had a cure since the late 1940s, but which kills about one and a half million people each year. That's 4,000 people every day. And like COVID-19, TB is an airborne disease and part of the strategy for stopping transmission of TB has been to put into place infection control measures that stop transmission in the air. And we've been doing this for years. And so when COVID-19, uh, when the outbreak began, we realized that some of our learnings from TB could be very relevant to creating safe public spaces. With COVID-19, we have a disease that is also passed largely through the air, through, through droplets and aerosols, and for which little infection control has been deployed in public spaces. So this is a great opportunity. Our center is focused on health equity, and I think we see with COVID-19 major gaps in making sure that public spaces, schools, courthouses, gyms, et cetera, are using the layers of technology that can keep people safe. It's, it's estimated that 34 to 42% of workers are, are deemed essential, so people that, that go to work and have been going to work, uh, even during lockdowns. And a significant proportion of these workers, one third of them, have incomes less than $40,000 a year. Half say they couldn't afford $500 in unanticipated expenses and are living on the margin. So throughout this epidemic, despite lockdowns and other interventions, there's been little investment in ensuring that, that essential workers, so medical personnel, transit workers, grocery store workers, first responders, teachers, students, critical office workers, and, and many, many others, all of us, are able to function in safe public spaces that have the appropriate environmental interventions in place. Instead, we focused on distancing, masks and other layers of intervention that have varying efficacy in stopping COVID-19 transmission. We've sadly missed interventions like ventilation and upper room UV germicidal lighting that we know work and don't rely on individual behavior and that may actually contribute in important ways to stopping the spread of the virus. So this is what we're here to discuss today at this workshop to learn more about the engineering interventions that can help us keep public spaces safe. And we have an incredible lineup of very experienced speakers today. We have David Sliney, Don Milton, Ed Nardell, Bill Bonfleth, and Paul Jensen. They'll introduce themselves and we'll put a, a link to their bios in the, in the chat. Um, they are the leaders in this field and have been for decades and we have much to learn from them. So, uh, I, I want to welcome everyone to this workshop. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank our esteemed speakers. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, we have a lot to learn and hopefully this will change the way we're looking at how to deal with this epidemic. Before we begin, I also want to hand over briefly to my friend and colleague, Tom Nicholson, who's the Executive Director of Advanced Access and Delivery, to say a few words. Thank you very much. Tom. Thanks, Salman. Good morning to everyone, uh, colleagues and, and participants and attendees. Uh, thank you for being here and taking the time to present today to my colleagues uh, on the panel and to engage in discussions on this important topic that someone just laid out for us. So my name is Tom Nicholson. I'm executive director of Advanced Access and Delivery. Uh, I'm also a researcher at Duke University's Sanford School of Public Policy and the Duke Center for International Development. I, I also work closely with the Stop TB Partnership at the UN Office for Project Services on Infectious Disease Program Design. Uh, our organization, Advanced Access and Delivery, is a global health nonprofit with partners and programs around the world. And we have a focus on tuberculosis and other diseases of poverty, as well as looming challenges of non-communicable diseases around the world. 
Uh, among the organizers, it was our work on TB at our global health delivery organizations and our academic centers that brought us to this point today. Uh, with the COVID-19 crisis of the last year, as Salman mentioned, we have suddenly been working much more in the US than previously seemed possible on airborne infection control. Uh, and many of us in the convening group have recently been working to share information on infection control in upper room UVC, facilitating the installation even of upper room UVC in congregate and institutional settings here in the US. Whether it's advising schools, homeless shelters, or houses of worship, it's been a challenging but rewarding process to see those places become safer for the people that congregate, worship, work, or live in those buildings. Uh, during that process, of discussing upper room UBC with policymakers, building managers, state and county health directors, and tribal health authorities, it became very clear that there's an urgent need for a sort of digestible overview of the state of the science on upper room UBC and just how that can apply to the fight against COVID-19 uh, and other future threats for that matter. So critically, we hope that through the course of this webinar, this information can be synthesized with practical guidance on how to integrate the design of URGUV into building plans or retrofit existing buildings with this technology. So we will discuss the safety profile of upper, upper room UVC, the basic science questions of how aerosols cause infection, and an overview of the theory behind using upper room UVC. And then we'll transition into how to look into integrating this technology into a total building infection control program and end with some common design principles for how to practically apply upper room GUV in multiple settings today. Uh, we'll then have a hopefully lively discussion on these issues. Um, and while I'm sure we could meet in person, you know, preferably under the comforting bluish glow of some upper room UVC, we really do appreciate the involvement of everyone here and, and the time that it takes to put these things together. And I would like to particularly thank Harvard Medical School and Sue Kulkarni and Tim Nichols for their work managing this process. Uh, pulling this group together. So it's without uh, further ado, I'd like to segue to Dr. David Sliney, who will discuss safety topics related to upper room UVC. Thank you. I'm a biophysicist and I've uh, spent my career working on, uh, oh dear, just a second. I'm the current chair of the Illuminating Engineering Society uh, photobiology committee and have been very active in a lot of, uh, of uh, safety studies of germicidal UV as well as efficacy. So uh, let me first explain just what is germicidal radiation or germicidal light. We normally are referring to the uh, shortest wavelengths of the of the optical spectrum, which is of course ultraviolet radiation. And from a photobiological standpoint, we split the ultraviolet band into three photobiological spectral bands known as UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVA is used for fluorescence detection, insect light traps, and a lot of specialized applications and is relatively safe compared to shorter wavelengths. Ultraviolet B radiation is the shortest part of the sunlight spectrum outdoors. Dave, Dave I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. We're not, unfortunately, we're not seeing your slide. Uh-oh, sorry. So we see in the lower right panel, the optical spectrum, and uh, we've split out the ultraviolet into these three photobiologically effective bands. The shortest band is ultraviolet C. And that is generally by far the most effective means for disinfection, particularly for disinfecting air. And uh, we also point out in a draft standard of the Illuminating Engineering Society that really UVC is the only truly effective spectral band. There are some slight effects, uh, germicidal effects from longer wavelength ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet B and ultraviolet A. Uh, ultraviolet B is in sunlight, and at least in the summertime, it's pretty effective in uh, uh, inactivating viruses out, out of doors in the air. It's the uh, germicidal approach 
with ultraviolet is really an old technology. When I was a boy many years ago, uh, it wasn't uncommon to see these in hospitals and medical clinics and in public bathrooms and things like this. Uh, it lost favor as we develop very effective vaccines and antibiotics so that we had to reinvent this practically with the uh, evolution of an uncontrollable virus, COVID-19. So uh, let me explain how germicidal radiation disinfects. It pri its primary target is DNA, or in the case of the SARS virus, RNA. And there's certain wavelengths that are more effective than others. In photobiology, we have something we refer to as an action spectrum. And you see an action spectrum for one inactivation of a very common uh, biomolecule known as E. coli, or a, it's a bacteria. And this was a common target back in the 40s and 50s when this was uh, produced. Now, each, each bacteria or virus has its own action spectrum. It can shift somewhat. But as a general rule, there are some uh, efficacy that's quite high at a primary emission line of the most common germicidal lamp, the mercury low pressure lamp which is 254 nanometers. So we see with this red line, which is that emission, uh, a very high effectiveness of well over 80%. Now, in recent years, there's been some very great interest in possibly other lamps other than the common mercury lamp, because the action spectra for a number of uh, bioaerosols has extended down into even shorter wavelengths than 254. And this is a study from the University of Colorado and NIST that shows, for example, that there's pretty high efficacy of short wavelengths such as that from a krypton chloride lamp, the 222 nanometer lamp. You'll probably hear more about that later. So what are, what are the safety issues? Because this always comes up as a concern when we have upper room germicidal UV. Well, there are two effects that are just on the surface of the eye and just on the surface of the skin. And these are, of course, welder's flash or snow blindness. The medical term is photokeratitis for the eyes. It feels like you have sand in your eyes, just like sunburn. It doesn't show up immediately. It shows up some hours later. It is transient though, and uh, beside the fact that it can be rather painful, it's not a real stopper issue if there is an accident, but we do everything we can to avoid any possible exposure to people in occupied space. Then we have erythema or skin reddening, which is similar to sunburn, but not nearly as uh, deep as we'll explain in a minute. Finally, the real concern are the delayed effects, and these would be skin cancers. And this shocking thing to a lot of biologists is that although the UVC is more energetic and the photons uh, more dangerous to living cells, the living cells of the skin and the epidermis are protected by uh, filtering by the outermost layers of the skin, as we'll explain in a minute. There is also an action spectrum that we use for safety for the emission limits or uh, human exposure limits. And these peak around 270 nanometers, and that's not too far distance from the peak for of the antibactericidal uh, rays. And here we see several uh, panels here that explain why the UVC is far less dangerous from a long-term exposure case than uh, the UVB in sunlight. Basically, the transmission into the basal layer of the epidermis where new cells are created all the time for 
the skin it is quite limited. Like one photon in a thousand actually reaches the basal layer or the germinative layer, the bottom layer of the epidermis. And this is where new cells are created. They move up and then in a couple of weeks, they die and become uh, the outermost protective layer known as the stratum corneum. And I wanna point out that 254 nanometers hardly penetrates very deeply into the epidermis. So it's not nearly the problem as uh, UVB that penetrates all the way to the basal layer. Now, 222 nanometers is incredibly safer because it hardly penetrates at all to the most superficial cells that will soon die and become part of the stratum corneum. So if we look at the action spectra, the key story in photobiology, we see an action spectrum for non-melanoma skin cancers, the most common types of skin cancers. And as you see, the peak, the most dangerous wavelengths are right around 300 nanometers, that's in sunlight. And then the relative risk drops dramatically compared to the superficial effects of photokeratitis or uh, I'll call it sunburn, uh, erythema. Now, there are safety standards to make germicidal systems safe. First of all, our uh, emission limits that are used in product safety standards and lamps are categorized into different risk groups. And the bare germicidal lamp is uh, quite potentially hazardous, but they are fixtured into louvered devices that limit the exposure to the upper room as the other speakers later will explain. Exposure limits on the other hand are what we use to be sure that people in the lower part of the room are safe or they're used in occupational settings where we're trying to find out how safe it is to be at some distance from a welding arc as shown in the lower panel. I mentioned that the mercury lamp is the most common lamp. It's also about the most efficient lamp uh, with a very high wall plug efficiency. And 90% of the energy is in this one emission line of 254 nanometers. That's why it's been so popular. But there are new sources coming along, LEDs and the krypton chloride lamp. Now there's some special details in assessing the risk when we uh, check the installation of an upper air germicidal system uh, where we have to have special safety meters that are calibrated for the particular lamp and a limited field of view to take into account that the biological effects are most severe if the rays are coming straight at us as opposed obliquely. And here's just an example of how an upper room system is set up where you have very high intensity uh, in the upper room above seven feet, above 2.1 meters. And this is possible with special louvered uh, fixtures, which direct the beam up in the direction of the ceiling and then the upper space. Down in the position of a standing person, we wanna be sure that the exposure limit is lowest uh, for assuring safety uh, of a person standing. But of course, nobody's going to be standing for eight hours a day, but they certainly can be sitting. And so we want to be sure that the eight hour limit applies to a lower area. So this is just an example of how an industrial hygienist or occupational safety person would uh, assess the relative uh, risk at different occupied spaces in the lower room. And finally, let me just say that there are several useful documents that you could refer to. The International Commission on Illumination, the CIE, uh, put out a technical report uh, more than a decade ago on the comparable risks of UV germicidal radiation. I also had a paper about nearly a decade ago on this subject. A and with that, I'll turn the, uh, uh, the talk over to uh, Don Milton. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at this uh, 
seminar today. Um, I'm Don Milton. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. Now, I've been studying aerobiology for about 30 years and especially looking at infectious bioaerosols and the mode of transmission of influenza and other respiratory viruses now for, for quite a while. And uh, I'm going to talk today about how respiratory viruses are transmitted. And um, this uh, next slide here, um, are you seeing my slides? Okay. Um, is showing uh, a summary of the modes of transmission of respiratory viruses. Uh, there are basically three general modes. One is touch, spray, and inhalation. Uh, and uh, touch where you're touching a person or an object that has a virus on it and, and uh, transferring that to your mucosal membranes or touching an object that has become contaminated and then transferring that to your mucosal membranes is one mode of transmission of infection. Another is to get sprayed with droplets by being close enough that ballistic spray droplets can fly from the source when they speak loudly and, and have a little bit of uh, droplets popping off from their mouth or cough or sneeze and there is a, a, a burst of droplets flying a few feet through the air. And then finally, by inhalation, by breathing in fine droplets that are wafting on air currents. And within those fine droplets, they can land at different sites. They can land in your nose if they're fairly large. They won't penetrate beyond your nose and throat. Um, or if they're a little smaller, they can penetrate deeper into the large airways. And we call those the thoracic aerosols. And finally, if they're very small, they can penetrate deep into the lung and deposit in the small airways and all the way out to the air sacs. Uh, far out into the lung. The, uh, these next few slides I borrowed from a wonderful presentation by my colleague uh, Lydia Molaska at uh, Brisbane um, and talking about how, where are these particles coming from and it's as though the respiratory tract is acting like a nebulizer and it has several different nebulizers in it. Uh, first, there is fluid blockages forming deep in the lung and they break open, they burst little bubbles and produce tiny droplets. Uh, second, uh, there's fluid on the larynx and when we speak and sing and our vocal folds vibrate, we generate little aerosols, also probably to some extent with a foam breakup mechanism. And finally, uh, when we are uh, speaking, uh, there is some saliva in the mouth that is also uh, uh, generated as an aerosol. Some of it is large droplet spray, but some of it is also small enough to be an aerosol. And uh, there are some recent literature uh, about this and how these surface deformations uh, favor the production of very small aerosol particles and also favor the concentration of viruses and bacteria into these tiny aerosol particles. This is a slide uh, from one of Dr. Marwaska's papers uh, showing how these uh, fluid lined small bronchioles can collapse and have a fluid film. And when they open, it's like there's a little bubble here that pops and leaves tiny droplets. And we and others have demonstrated that this really works, that if you have somebody exhale to residual volume, to blow all the air out of their lung, like they're a good singer or they're speaking in a lecture and they don't want to take a breath before they finish the sentence, and then take a deep breath, that they close off the airways and then pop them open again. And when you do that, you generate a lot more droplets in your breath, a lot more tiny aerosol particles in your breath than you do when you're just breathing at normal lung volumes quietly. So 
what Dr. Marwaska has shown is that there are these different particle sizes that come from these different uh, parts of the breathing site and respiratory cycle. Very small particles that say suspended in air, mostly coming from bronchial fluid burst mode. Uh, laryngeal vibration makes a little bit bigger ones. And finally, the oral speech articulation makes quite large ones. Some of them are really just big drops flying through the air in ballistic trajectories. So how big are the virus-laden particles? Well, the naked virus is quite small, but in the air, it's really traveling in a droplet and there's water around it. And so it's bigger than the naked virus. But because of this enrichment mechanism, uh, it tends to be very small, still less than a micron. And so what happens when, when we're with other people is that we're generating aerosols with talking, coughing, or just breathing. And these droplets are then floating in the air around us. And they're more concentrated close to us than they are farther away. Also close to us, there tend to be more big ones because they will tend to settle out of the air more quickly than the very small ones. Now, what evidence do we have that this is important, particularly in COVID-19? Well, one of the pieces of evidence comes from a study done in a hospital room in Florida where they put air samplers in the room where there were two patients, there was a, a curtain between them and there was one sampler over here and one sampler over here. And the samplers picked up virus and they were able to culture the virus from the air, showing that indeed it was infectious, that it traveled across the room and uh, was small enough to be breathed in deep into the lung. Uh, there have been a couple of outbreaks in restaurants that have been carefully studied. This one in Guangzhou was analyzed by uh, Professor Hugo Lee at Hong Kong University. He got the surveillance cameras that were in the room, monitored how long people were in their seats and whether they got closer to each other or not. Uh, also did tracer gas releases in the restaurant and showed that the air because of the way the air conditioning system was working, this was winter time, they were on heat cycle, the exhaust vents on this wall were closed off, and the air was basically just going in a loop in this back end of the restaurant, and people much farther than two meters or six feet away were infected, some as much as 4.6 meters away, who otherwise did not have any closer contact with the index case. Another more recent report about a restaurant in South Korea. This couple came in the back door. These two people here were in separate parties and came in the front door. They never went close to each other. And yet 20 feet from the index case to the farthest away infected person. This can only be happening by aerosols. Now, it may be that you're more likely to infect people up close, but it depends then on how the airflow is happening in the room. And so, in summary, we can generate aerosols. They come from the lung in different size ranges, and they are, um, uh, depending on whether they're coming from the upper respiratory tract or lower respiratory tract, they're larger or smaller. You can also generate aerosols by shaking out a sheet or uh, flushing a toilet, and they have different size distributions. They then behave in the air um, by the nature of where they come from, what size they were, how much water they had in them, what the temperature and relative humidity is, how fast they then fall out of the air, and how fast the biological agent in them decays. We know, however, with SARS-CoV-2, in a study done in New Orleans, at about 50% relative humidity and 23 degrees Celsius, that the virus can survive in the air for at least 16 hours, much longer than ventilation, even in a poorly ventilated room would remove it from the air.
And then where it goes depends on how big it is. If it's still pretty big, it'll land in your nose. If it's smaller, it will get farther down into the lung. And that, in summary, is what we know about how viruses are transmitted. So I'm now going to turn this over to my colleague, uh, Ed Nardell, who will begin bring us back to how this then applies to sanitizing the air and UV for protection against infection transmission. Thank you for your attention. There we go. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Edward Nardell. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and also at Harvard School of Public Health in the departments of environmental health and also infections and immunology. I'm going to be talking to you about the theory and application of germicidal UV, particularly upper room germicidal UV, from the perspective of a physician who has applied this over many decades now. I first encountered um, germicidal UV as a uh, uh, tuberculosis officer in Boston, where we had an outbreak of TB in a homeless shelter. TB, as has been mentioned, is a uh, strictly airborne infection, and uh, it has uh, been long known to be uh, subject to environmental controls, as you'll see in a moment, um, particularly with UV. I happened to start working with Richard Riley at the time, a pioneer in this area, and together we uh, worked on getting UV fixtures, which had not been in use widely by that time uh, in the 80s, to uh, this homeless shelter and subsequently have done some original research in this area over the past many years. I'll be talking about that research. My slide is not advancing. Here we go. There we go. Yep, thank you. Uh, there we go. Uh, so just to point out, as had been mentioned by several speakers, that this is not new technology. Here is a 1946 textbook by Matthew Lukish um, describing the uh, application of germicidal UV for air disinfection. And again, this is 1946, and even then it wasn't new uh, technology. Uh, in 1942, uh, Wells published a study of upper room germicidal UV to prevent measles transmission in schools. And he chose some schools outside of Philadelphia. And you see in this uh, uh, picture, in this graph, the attack rate of measles in the upper classes and in the lower classes. The upper classes are those uh, w w children who were had perhaps some immunity from prior exposure and were expected to have less measles than in the younger classes. But you see here that with UV in the upper room, and I'll show you a picture of what that looked like, uh, there was indeed uh, much less transmission in the lower classes in two different schools very convincing evidence. In fact, one of the best uh, epidemiologic studies that we have of, of upper room in, in uh, UV. So the picture to the left is actually from one of those school rooms. And you see upper room UV fixtures on the wall. And um, frankly, the fixtures in use today are not much different. These are mercury lamps, as uh, Dave Sliney described. And you see here in another uh, classroom, an upper room UV fixture, this one intended to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, uh, that's not the only study uh, demonstrating efficacy. Uh, this is another in, in, in the real world. This is a 1957-58 Livermore VA hospital um, observational study. This was not a planned study, but they had upper room UV in the hospital for TB purposes, and along comes a flu, an annual flu uh, pandemic, which with a very high attack rate of 18 percent. And it turned out that in those wards where UV was in place, the attack rate was uh, a fraction of what it was in those 
where there was no upper room UV. Again, not a planned study, not a controlled study, but rather convincing um, evidence of about a 90% effectiveness in preventing the spread of a, uh, uh, an infection with a strong airborne component. So there are various ways to apply upper room germicidal. One is what I'll call UV in a box. That is a room air cleaner where you uh, actually confine the UV to a, a device where uh, air is pumped through. And I'll show you a picture of what one of these looks like. And the advantage here is that you just plug it in and there is no exposure risk as described by Dave Sliney, even though that risk is very controllable and minor compared to the um, risk of the infection that we're trying to prevent. The disadvantage of UV in a box, that is of all room air cleaners with and without filters, is that um, uh, it's difficult to move all of the room air through one small box to achieve high equivalent air changes per hour. And I'll tell you what I mean by equivalent air changes per hour shortly. There's also the potential to retreat the air that has just been uh, through the machine and thereby reduce efficiency. So you'll see that upper room UV has some distinct advantages over uh, simply um, putting UV in a box. The other way is to put UV in an HVAC system. And Dr. Banif, who will follow me, uh, will talk further about um, ventilation systems. The advantage is it's out of sight. There are no safety issues. The disadvantage is, is that it really disinfects only air after it leaves the room. And, and it's also limited by the flow rate of the ventilation system. And I, I say rather strongly here, SARS-CoV-2 virus is not recirculated. At least there's not a lot of evidence of room to room spread of this uh, uh, virus. Don Milton showed you very convincing evidence of spread within a restaurant uh, it's quite some distance, and it was going through a kind of ventilation system. It was going through a a uh, a, a uh, ductless air conditioner, but really not very uh, not very far, and not not so, so. We're not talking about going from floor to floor, from room to room, and then there are whole room air disinfection, which is what we're talking about with. Uh, operating rooms and autopsy rooms and hospital rooms where you're trying to prevent nosocomial infections. And various forms of UV can be used for that, 254 from mercury. And also, uh, you can use uh, newer LED lamps. The disadvantage there is that UV is not really a great disinfectant of surfaces because even micro shadows can protect anything on a surface that uh, is not directly exposed to the UV. However, it has been shown to be effective in uh, hospital rooms at very high intensities with robots that move around the room trying to get around those shadows. Now, 222 is mentioned by Dave Sliney. It's far UV. It is, uh, has much less risk for human exposure because of its limited penetration. And it can disinfect surfaces, although it's subject to the same limitations as uh, the uh, longer wavelength UV, uh, 254. And right now, it's rather expensive and limited uh, access, uh, but that is going to be changing rapidly as uh, 222 becomes more commonly available. And uh, hopefully, the price will fall as well. And finally, upper room UV advantages. It uses the large volume of air in the upper part of the room as a disinfection chamber and allows that air to mix with the lower room, which it does at rather low velocity, but very effectively creating air disinfection in the lower room. And I'll illustrate this moment momentarily. Let's get the slides to change in the right direction. There we go. So this is an example of UV in a box. The top of the uh, unit is removed. You see a fan. Uh, there's a place where you could put a filter. And then there are some UV lamps that intensely irradiate the air going through it. Again, nice in that UV is out of the air. But moving the air, of all the air of, of the room through such a device is, is a real challenge uh, in, a, in a 
to achieve the six to 12 air changes that we'd like to see uh, with uh, upper room germicidal UV or with in general. This is the um, schematic just giving you an idea of how upper room germicidal UV works. We irradiate the upper room. In this case, there's a rather narrow beam, but it is actually not that narrow as, as this, uh, displayed in this uh, drawing. And warm air tends to rise in a room due to body heat and disinfected air from the upper room will, is then displaced back into the lower room. And of course, fans, and um, we like to use low velocity ceiling fans in, in some applications, assures good air mixing. That's not always appropriate for every setting. And UV works without such fans, but the better the air mixing, the better the air disinfection in the lower room. These are examples of uh, fixtures which um, generate a limited uh, uh, amount of UV in the upper room and, and keeps it out of the lower room. Uh, my colleague who is going to follow in a few uh, talks here, uh, Paul Jensen and Grigor Volchenkov in uh, Vladimir, Russia, did a study comparing various air changer, uh, various air cleaners uh, to upper room germicidal UV from a cost effectiveness point of view. And I won't go through the details of this study just to show you that upper room UV was by far the most efficient. And these fixtures were not fancy. They were uh, made in Russia and very simple design, but turned out to be roughly nine and a half times more cost effective than ventilation as a way to disinfect uh, large volumes of air. Uh, so the key points here are the 254 is very easily produced by um, mercury vapor lamps, as David Slaney mentioned, perhaps the most efficient way to generate UV. LEDs um, and uh, uh, are, are coming along and involve no mercury, which is important for the environment. Uh, they work on lower current and can be run on batteries and generate slightly higher UV wavelengths, which is slightly less safe but also highly effective for disinfecting air. Uh, again, not it's in the UVC band, so this is not nearly as uh, concerning as UV in uh, sunlight, for example. Um, <clears throat> there's very low skin penetration. I don't need to elaborate on this. David Sliney did a beautiful job in telling you about that. And I apologize for the slow movement here. Every time I, I lose my uh, arrow, there we go. And then microbes, as uh, David pointed out, are highly vulnerable to, to this wavelength. So David Sliney showed you the slide again, and he didn't show the two uh, bandwidths for erythema, photokeratitis, and skin cancer, which are a, a bit removed from the, the target of the uh, bactericidal effect action curve that we want. Uh, this is an important slide and I'll, I won't, darn it. So we compare upper room germicidal to room air changes. Now we're not actually removing the air, we're treating it in the room, but how do we make that comparison? And this is a simple way to look at that. If one air change removes about 63% of well-mixed contaminated air, the next air change removes about 63% of what's left. And the next air change removes 63% of what's left. So we're always removing a small portion of what remains. And so you end up with this um, curve, which makes it harder and harder to get rid of those last remaining uh, concentration of, uh, of particles, whether they're bacteria or viruses or whatever. We say when UV inactivates 63% of the infectious organisms in a room without removing them, that we've achieved the equivalent of one air change. So although, and when viruses are continually generated, as Don Milton described, you really need to have very high levels of air disinfection to get lower and lower and lower in terms of concentration. And that's one six to 12 air changes are recommended and sometimes even more. So we did a study in South Africa uh, comparing 
are looking at the effectiveness of, of, of upper room UV to stop TB transmission in a TB hospital with six hospital patients in the hospital um, uh, rooms, as you see in the middle here, and the air delivered to guinea pig uh, exposure chambers as depicted in these uh, uh, panels where, and guinea pigs are highly, highly uh, 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 susceptible to, um, you, to, to TB. And here we see a, a typical upper room fixture, a ceiling fan, and the fact that we were ventilating this room and removing air from the lower part of the room, the breathing zone into the, um, and we did this every other day. So uh, the day, the, every other day the UV was on or off and every other day um, the uh, UV was exposing the guinea pigs either with or without UV on in the, in the patient rooms. And the, at the end of, uh, this slide has apparently gotten distorted, I apologize for that. Uh, it shows you that at the end of several months of exposure that we had about an 80% reduction of risk uh, in the, um, uh, on the days when the UV was on compared to the days when the UV was off. And this was the equivalent of adding 24 equivalent air changes by UV. Very difficult to do in any circumstances with ventilation or room air cleaners. Finally, uh, as mentioned, uh, LEDs are coming along quickly in response to COVID-19. And uh, it, it is a um, potentially better way to up radiate the upper room. They're not as efficient as mercury lamps but they allow for a lot of design features. Finally, uh, David mentioned uh, basically exposure in the room. We did a study where we monitored uh, patients with um, uh, personal monitors for UV and showed that under a variety of settings, patients, nurses, office workers in a classroom, that although one could measure high levels of UV, higher levels of UV in the upper at eye level, what people actually were exposed to was only a fraction of what they would be exposed to if they were staring in the direction of the UV lamp, which no one does. So it's very important. Uh, David showed 0.2 microwatts as a goal. That would be a continuous stare time. We actually get the maximum we got here was the third of the exposure level that is allowed by virtue of um, uh, the fact that we move around, etc. And in summary, I've shown you that upper room UV is by far the most efficient method for air disinfection in rooms where it's feasible. Can't be done in rooms with low ceilings, for example. Upper room UV is safe for room occupants, and it is uh, uh, upper LED and whole room far UV may be having a larger role in air disinfection, replacing mercury lamps in, in the near future. And there I'll stop and pass this on to Bill Banneth, who will be talking further about various approaches to disinfecting air in, in rooms. Thanks very much, Ed. Uh, my name is Bill Bonfleth, and I'm a mechanical engineer and a member of the faculty of the Department of Architectural Engineering at Penn State have been there since 1994, and I've worked in uh, practice as a consulting engineer. Previously to that, I've done research on uh, germicidal ultraviolet systems since the late uh, 1990s, mainly looking at airstream disinfection, not uh, so much upper room. And um, my talk today has to do with putting uh, germicidal ultraviolet in the context of overall uh, infection control programs and a building, and I'll try to do that here in uh, the uh, 10 minutes that I have uh, efficiently and clearly. So as has already been uh, noted, uh, aerosol or airborne transmission of COVID-19 has been uh, acknowledged by public health authorities, and we know that there are many other uh, diseases that transmit that way. Uh, we also have heard from those organizations that uh, fomite or intermediate surface transmission may occur, but I haven't seen much evidence of it myself. Uh, recently in October, uh, airborne transmission started to get some attention from CDC and WHO, but it's 
been a concern of others uh, in the engineering community for a long time. Um, we have lots of incidents like the one that's already been mentioned that suggest uh, in-room airborne transmission, the Guangzhou restaurant and, and many others. I, I want to uh, follow up something that uh, Ed Nardell said, though, that uh, uh, we have seen a study of uh, hospital air handling units in uh, Oregon that found penetration of viral RNA all the way through uh, a healthcare uh, air handling unit, which had MERV-15 final filters. Um, so it seems pretty clear that, at least in some concentration, uh, viral aerosol is being recirculated in systems. And uh, the reason we don't see room-to-room -room infections is most likely due to concentration, not actual absence. Uh, in recent uh, weeks, we've seen the publication of an article that uh, strongly implicates transmission of fecal aerosol through plumbing systems in uh, nine infections amongst three families in an apartment building in Korea. And another uh, Korean study found uh, multiple <clears throat> infections, 10 cases uh, in apartments that were all connected <clears throat> to the same two natural ventilation shafts uh, and stack effect within the building could cause uh, air from one apartment to enter, enter another. Uh, these are things that we saw with the original SARS outbreak in uh, Amway Gardens, which was a particularly heavily studied case. So it can occur. But let's get to the, uh, the main point here, um, which is that <clears throat> germicidal ultraviolet is an engineering control and fits into that uh, part of the uh, risk management process with other engineering controls. Um, so those include ventilation, the, the dilution and exhaust of contaminated air, filtration to remove particles from the air, and then things that are uh, rather generically described as uh, air cleaners. Germicidal light is one of them. There's also um, a large group of, of what I would call additive air cleaners that put things into the air that are supposed to be disinfectants, ions, hydrogen peroxide, gas, uh, various oxidative radicals. Um, I've grayed these out because although they exist and they're being strongly promoted uh, relative to germicidal ultraviolet, there's a very weak evidence base for the effectiveness of these devices and, and also for their uh, safety. I would say that at, at best the record there is incomplete. Um, all of these controls have applications in central air conditioning systems and also in a distributed way. So there's a lot of flexibility as to how we can address the engineering control part of um, a, a layered risk management strategy. And, and uh, should point out that what we're looking at is control of uh, the airborne or aerosol part of the uh, risk. Uh, we still need masks and we still need distancing because of the risk that uh, cannot be mitigated simply by reducing the concentration of um, virus or, or bacteria pathogen in the air. And we've seen uh, some discussion of that previously in one of the earlier talks. Uh, Lydia Burweba's um, image <clears throat> that shows a sneeze traveling eight meters uh, should be instructive to everyone as to the importance of wearing masks. The, the image in the lower left here also shows the impact of a mask on reducing the, uh, the short range risk from droplet spray. <clears throat> so how do we fit an engineering control into an overall uh, aerosol risk uh, management plan? One way to do it is to, to look at the um, Wells-Riley model, which has been extensively used during the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, this essentially tells us that if we can reduce the airborne concentration, we're going to reduce the, uh, the risk of infection. So the Wells-Riley equation relates the probability of new infections to the rate at which infectious quanta are being emitted <clears throat> and the uh, uh, rate at which they're being diluted by uncontaminated air and also by the um, amount of time that uh, susceptible individuals are exposed to that concentration. So we can use this model to determine what flow of uncontaminated air it would take to achieve uh, what we consider an acceptable level of uh, airborne risk. Uh, 
in, in simplest terms, that simply refers to ventilation. But it's possible, as uh, Ed Nardell pointed out, to express the performance of any control in terms of uh, equivalent air changes. So we can do that for air cleaners, and we can do that for germicidal ultraviolet. And then if, as shown in the equation at the bottom of this slide, we have um, a target <clears throat> for uncontaminated air, <clears throat> we can add up all of the controls to reach that total. And that includes not just ventilation and filtration and germicidal ultraviolet and other air cleaners, but we can also account for uh, removal mechanisms like deposition and inactivation. So we have to have ventilation in all buildings. It's required by code and it helps to reduce the exposures to all contaminants. Uh, the problem for most of our buildings is that the standards that are used to define the required ventilation rates um, are really addressing odor control and uh, some building related contaminants, VOCs and particulate matter that we might find in buildings. So the, uh, the non-residential standards are um, much lower in terms of the prescribed ventilation rates than a healthcare standard, ASHRAE standard 62.1 uh, versus ASHRAE standard 170, for example. Uh, filtration is also required in ventilation standards to remove particulate matter. And again, we have a similar situation for uh, non-healthcare buildings. The, the minimum filter efficiencies required for those buildings by standards like ASHRAE standard 62.1 and 62.2 don't really uh, have much impact on uh, respiratory droplet nuclei uh, that might be in the air. So they're, they're not really effective as infection control devices. Uh, I've put a table in the lower left in this uh, figure that shows the uh, required minimum efficiencies in different particle size ranges for MERV 6 and 8, and you can see that they're not very good in that 0.3 uh, micron to 3 micron range, uh, ranges 1 and, and 2. Uh, I've overlaid those three size ranges on a respiratory droplet spectrum on the right, and uh, you can see that uh, we're missing most of the, the droplets that might contain uh, viruses or, or bacteria. Uh, so we need to upgrade filters to MERV-13 just to start to have a significant impact there, which is a standard piece of guidance. So uh, we need to have minimum ventilation and should have MERV-13 filters. What do we do uh, to go beyond that? Because even uh, the upgraded filter and minimum ventilation are not going to be sufficient. So we can supplement with GUV or, or other <clears throat> technologies. Uh, brief comparison of Airstream versus upper room. Uh, Airstream tends to be less expensive. You can do a system for much less per square foot uh, with uh, HVAC installed UV than for upper room, but you're putting UV in series with filters. So it's an incremental effect. And the clean uh, airflow that can be produced is limited to whatever the system is providing, which might be uh, five air changes per hour or less. The upper room systems, although more expensive, can produce much higher levels of uh, uh, equivalent air changes. In fact, some of the published uh, studies have reported uh, hundreds of, of air changes per hour equivalent. Uh, so where, where can we use these technologies? Um, upper room seems to be a good application in any densely occupied large space, lunch rooms, restaurants, auditoriums, uh, where it would make sense to make the investment in a uh, more expensive but very effective system. Uh, we can also use UV to treat surfaces if we're concerned about fomites. We don't really have a lot of concern about that mode of transmission anymore for um, COVID-19, but it is done in healthcare settings for uh, HAI pathogens. And we could be doing it routinely if the, uh, the FAR UVC uh, systems come into widespread use that were briefly mentioned. Uh, getting close to the, the end here, I want to mention uh, the general approach to infection uh, control for airborne transmission that's uh, being disseminated by ASHRAE, my organization. I'm the, uh, the chair of its epidemic task force. Uh, following public health guidance is important. Wear masks and distance. 
uh, provide minimum ventilation per code, upgrade filters as we've discussed. And then uh, the next layer is using various types of air disinfection or air cleaner uh, technology to get to the levels that we really want to be at. And then the, the final important uh, recommendation is to make sure that systems are properly commissioned. There are a lot of poorly functioning systems that are contributing a lot to risk. So uh, in, in summary, engineering controls are uh, only one aspect of uh, a risk management program. Uh, there's a baseline of ventilation and filtration built into code. So we build on that with other technologies. Uh, GUV certainly has the uh, ability to be an important supplementary control to the required ventilation and filtration. We've looked at the, uh, the differences briefly between Airstream and upper room. Uh, it's somewhat of an economic versus performance trade-off. And finally, this equivalent uncontaminated airflow rate approach is the basis that's emerging as the uh, method for uh, designing specific infection control programs for a particular building. So thank you for your attention. And uh, the last thing I want to mention is that the URL for ASHRAE's uh, COVID-19 resources is shown there on this uh, slide, ashrae.org slash COVID-19. And so with that, I'll conclude and uh, pass it over to our last speaker, Paul Jensen. Thank you. And good morning, good afternoon. And I say good afternoon because some of these folks may be uh, taking a look at it uh, on recording. Uh, I'm Paul Jensen. Uh, I retired last year from uh, CDC after 33 years of service and then before that 10 years of Coast Guard. So I thank the US government for supporting me. Uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about really the application. You know, How would you go about this whole process of uh, implementing a UVC system. So I'm gonna just do one quick quote first, and that's uh, from uh, Paracelsus. And that's, what is there that is not poison? All things are poison and nothing is without poison. Solely the dose, and that's what we're gonna be talking about, what uh, others have talked about so far. It's the dose that determines that a thing is not a poison. So when we take a look at uh, NOAEL stands for no adverse effect level. Uh, people have talked about that a little bit, but what we want to do is in the occupied space, essentially we want uh, safe levels of UVC. In the upper part of the room, we want unsafe levels of UVC. Why? Because we want to inactivate the bacteria or viruses. Uh, Bill talked about ASHRAE. Uh, ASHRAE and the Illumination Engineers Engineering Society has a joint document on commissioning. And the reason why I want to talk about commissioning is because it's one critical part that's overlooked when one thinks about installing or it actually does install UBC systems. And the commissioning process is from pre-design through occupancy and operations. And it's really to ensure that the building performs as desired. And one part of a commissioning plan are the acceptance requirements or performance requirements. And that's what a lot of people are calling commissioning, but it's really not commissioning itself. It's part of the process. What I'm showing here is a design cycle. It doesn't, uh, the actual words don't really mean a lot uh, other than you know, you've got a starting point, you analyze the situation, you look for uh, options, you make decisions. But the important thing about this diagram is, you know, as you go around, you may go back to the immediate step before, or you may find that, okay, once we get to the decision point, ah, what we originally decided isn't feasible for some reason. So they may get, just go back to search or they may have to reanalyze the situation. So when we talk about uh, the commissioning process or the process of uh, implementing UVC systems, we have to think about many, many different things. I'm gonna give you an example of an installation I helped with at Salvation Army in Oklahoma City. And this project was funded through the START Coalition in Oklahoma. And also uh, my part was funded through AA and D. And I always go to Google Maps or Apple Maps beforehand to see what does the building look like from the sky? 
And the reason I do this is if, if you take a look, you can see this is a gamish of different buildings. Uh, and it gives me a feel for, okay, what's, what's actually going on here when I, when I do my walkthrough? And then the next thing I'll do is I'll take a look at plans and whatnot. But I want to start out with the risk assessment. So what are the microorganisms or diseases of concern? Obviously, uh, today's webinar is about coronavirus. There's mention of TB and influenza. There may be a combination of those. So, so what are we trying to control with the upper room UBC? And then what kind of clients or people will be in that uh, area? When, uh, what's the epidemiology of them? Are they high risk? for uh, infection? Are they uh, high risk for carriers? Are they immune compromised? So we wanna understand essentially the people that are uh, gonna be in that building. In this case, the Salvation Army building, be staff, volunteers, and clients. And what kinds of IPC plans do they have? What kinds of policies and practices have been implemented and to what extent? This is just a placeholder, but it's, it's not Salvation Army, but they deal a lot with the homeless population of Oklahoma City. They provide uh, an evening meal once a, once a day. They pull back on that a little bit because of COVID and now just have uh, pack food packets they, they hand out. They also have food that they uh, load up grocery carts with and donate to uh, folks that, that come in with their appointments. Utility and rent assistance. So there's a lot of face-to-face -face time with clients. They have some temporary housing and transition housing in the facility. And they also uh, now have a winter shelter. And I'll talk about the winter shelter at the end. But the starting point is, okay, do they have a set of plans? Uh, and you go through and, and you have to take a look at, okay, what's being uh, uh, done? What activities are in different areas? And, and try to identify, okay, what areas might be of risk and of concern to you? So part of the facility assessment is taking a look at, is it feasible to install upper room UBC systems? What's the ceiling height, both physical ceiling height and effective ceiling height? And I'll show a couple of pictures to talk about that. What kind of limitations uh, might there be due to activities in the spaces? What, you know, do they have electricity? Uh, what kinds of air mixing might they have or might they need? Do they have ceiling fans or wall fans? Do they have a ventilation system that they can keep the fan on 24-7 uh, and that the diffusers are designed and flow rate sufficient to get good air mixing? So the first thing we did was we prioritized the areas. You can see there are a lot of priority one areas, uh, fewer priority two, three priority three, and then a question mark here because they, they didn't really think they'd be using the tornado shelter for anything. Then we calculated room area, room volume, and came up with how much UV approximately do we need in that area? And these numbers are based on what's needed for tuberculosis and not necessarily COVID. We know that the coronavirus is more susceptible to UV, and in this case, we're talking 254 nanometer, than uh, TB. So if, it can, if it's sufficient for TB, it's sufficient for coronavirus. And then we took a look at what fixtures did we have available. Uh, Aeromed at the time had five different classifications of fixtures. If you look at the right for UVC output, there are five different outputs. So what we tried to do is we tried to say, okay, how much UV do we need and how many fixtures of what size might be appropriate? And we came up with an initial recommendation. Now that's not the final recommendation because what we had to do next is take a look at the initial uh, room and do a layout. So here's their dining hall. And uh, how big is this? Well, I didn't put the numbers there, but it's relatively large. The, the width is 42 feet, the longest stretch is 54. And then there's a bump out for the serving area here that's 47 feet. And then clients would go through the serving area, pick up their food and then sit on one of the, uh, the tables. So it's a relatively large room. And here, here's a picture of pointing towards one of the long walls. What are these things from the ceiling? They're decorative, but they also help stop the noise. So what's the ceiling height? Is it this top part, which is the roof, bottom of the roof? Or is it the bottom of these uh, uh, noise 
absorbers. Well, we just use the bottom of these noise absorbers for a couple of reasons. One is you can see some ductwork here. They had ductwork that was blowing air down at an angle and you could, you could, if you put your hands up a little bit, you could feel it. So they probably had relatively good mixing when the ventilator was on. So what they did for a policy was they said, okay, we're gonna have the fans on continuous. And then yeah, obviously in uh, heating season, the heat can cycle on and off, but not the fans. The fans will always be on. And the same reverse is true for the uh, cooling. So let's go back to this uh, diagram again. So what we decided to do was install five of the max units. So here's uh, one on the short wall facing or pointing towards the uh, food area. There's also a large TV on this wall. So we decided, well, we didn't want to put anything in this wall. So we, again, put one behind most people and we put uh, two on each of the long walls, but stagger them. So this was sufficient dose to enact in that, in that room. So the next really is the luminary installation adjustment. So what is it? It's, it's not hard labor, but uh, unless it's a, uh, you know, a cement wall, then you have to drill a little bit harder. But you know, we need to find the locations. You know, is this an ideal location? Well, what, what's this right here? It's blocking things. So, you may draw something on paper when you go out to actually do the install, you have to, you know, in, engage the brain and say, okay, is this make sense? You know, this is a temporary, was originally a temporary thing in this large room that became permanent. So, so we needed to change the, the location. Uh, when we're installing fixtures initially, what we try to do, this is just an app on a, uh, on a phone, was we try to install the luminaire on a, in a neutral position. We know from experience, if it's got a short ray length or it's pointing towards a wall that's not very far away, we can generally point them down a few degrees. If it's a very uh, high ceiling and a very long distance, we probably need to point it up a few degrees. So, so that's part of the uh, installation is doing that course adjustment. And uh, this guy is asking, okay, what reading are you getting? because he was gonna climb up the ladder and do some more adjustments. But we wanted to go through the facility. I'll talk about measurements in a moment and see, okay, is, is it safe for occupants? Is it unsafe for whatever might be airborne you know, above a certain point? So what I'm gonna talk about now, I'm calling it final acceptance testing or final performance testing. And just to be clear, this is not commissioning. A lot of people call this commissioning. It's really one step in the commissioning process but it's, it has a specific purpose. So here are two folks. Here's a, uh, uh, a painter's pole, a level to make sure they get it square and a detector. Uh, most folks will measure uh, for safety at a standing eye height. The 95 percentile is about five and a half feet. The 99 percentile is about 5.9 feet. So somewhere in this range is the height for the detector. And this person is just under five feet tall. So you can kind of see that it's a relatively high thing. Now this fellow jumped up on the, uh, well, the ladder to the table, but he's doing an adjustment to the fixture. And here you can see we're measuring 0 0.39 microwatts per square centimeter. And that's perfectly fine. Now we'll also take a look, you know, what's happening in the room. You know, this is an area for uh, sleeping. You know, people won't be standing that often. They definitely won't be staring at the, fixtures, but we wanted to test each bed to see, okay, is there reflection off of something? And we did find reflection off of this ductwork. Let's go back to the dining area. This is a panorama photograph, but here's a long wall, a short wall, and a long wall. And you can see two luminaires here, one at the end, and one over here. So what about operation maintenance? We need to make sure we clean the lamp, we clean the reflector regularly, and then just do a, a spare set of safety measurements to make sure you can see uh, that you know, people will not be overexposed. This is the Salvation Army, this is another shelter, but uh, there's just a picture of some folks uh, taking measurements. Now we have to talk about changes in priorities. Over time, things are gonna change. So go back to this initial design process and see, okay, what do we need 
to do. In this case, uh, there were limited winter shelter beds in Oklahoma City. So the Salvation Army opened up their tornado shelter for women during cold weather. And here's the tornado shelter, not very attractive, but there are number, it's, it's a very long skinny uh, uh, room, but you can see there's a number of UV fixtures in there. And I like this picture just because you can see that it truly is upper room UV and there were fans on either end. So let's talk briefly about life cycle costs. Life cycle costs are, you know, everything you'd have to uh, invest into this product from the standpoint of your initial plan to dealing with the commissioning process, your design brief, your design specifications, construction, installation, your acceptance testing, operation and maintenance. So my question for you is over the life of a UVC luminaire, how much will it cost to procure, install, operate and maintain it? Well, it'll be two to five times the initial capital cost. So it's not, once you install it, you don't run away from it. We have to operate and maintain it properly. So to summarize, we wanna make sure we have quality lamps and luminaires, uh, good design and installation, ensure we have air mixing because we know without air mixing, effectiveness is very low. We want to make sure we do final acceptance performance testing make sure we uh, maintain them. And remember that UVC systems do not replace the requirement for fresh air. We still need to have some fresh air. So on that note, you'll see this in the uh, uh, presentation. There are two documents through the Stop TV partnership, one on uh, a general one on uh, UVC, another one on operation and uh, maintenance of UVC luminaires. So I thank you. And I'll turn this back to uh, Salman and uh, Tom. Thanks so much, Paul. And thank you to all the speakers. This has really been an enlightening session. As many of you have seen, there's a lot of questions that have come in the question and answer session, and they've actually been, many of them have been answered in writing. So um, I see one hand up from Francis Hogan, and maybe we can start to take, um, uh, take some, oh, so can we hear Francis if their hand is up? No, we can't unmute attendees, so they'll have to okay. put questions through the Q and A. Okay, so so um, the, uh, um, the the I'll, I'll read from questions in the Q and A. Francis, I'm sorry, the way we have this set up, you're going to have to write your question in the Q and A. So why don't we take the first question, and, and any of the speakers can of course answer this. Um, is upper room GUV as effective in the center of a large room as it is around the perimeter? And, and you guys can just decide who, or all of you, <laughs> who's best uh, suited to, to I would, answer. I would just say that the location of the UV is, is not so critical as what the average uh, irradiance is in the upper room. And um, you know, there are rooms that are better suited for um, fixtures that are in the center of a room and others that are better suited for walls and ray length matters. And perhaps Paul won't want to pick up on this as well. Yeah, thank you, Ed. And uh, the, the answer really is it depends. So that's why we do the, the assessments. If you took a look at that large room, you know, we tried to put the uh, luminaires on the outside, on the peri perimeter to make sure that we could get the, you know, the maximum length for the UV. When we took measurements, when we had all five on, you know, along the center, we actually found, you know, hot spots. So what we need to do is, you know, try to get relatively uniform UV flux. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we don't want, you know, one, you know, one fixture all, you know, shining to one corner of the room. We'd like to get some of the UV spread throughout and we need the air mixing. There's a laboratory study conducted by uh, Shelly Miller and her students in uh, University of Colorado Berkeley, or sorry, Boulder, and what they found was there's an 88-0% reduction in efficiency without proper air mixing. So, so I can't, uh, you know, emphasize enough the importance of air mixing, but it doesn't have to be a hurricane. You know, some, there was a study uh, by uh, Steve Rudnick and other colleagues at Harvard where they found that you know, they only needed 0.05 meters per second air velocity 
to have a uh, relatively good mixing over. Uh, Paul, I just want to add that, that, you know, in, for example, a crowded uh, Salvation Army dining room, there's actually quite a bit of air mixing uh, even for body heat from um, uh, people moving around in the room. So although I, we like, I think, to mix air mechanically because it provides some assurance, there really is a potential for a lot of uh, air mixing. But, you know, we, we hate to leave that to chance. Uh, it depends on the setting. Yeah, I would rec remind uh, you know people of the, the work we did in the chamber up uh, on the roof at Harvard, um, where with heat boxes to simulate people there, we increased the effective air changes from about seven to 16. But when we added a ceiling fan, we moved it up to over 90 equivalent air changes an hour. So. Um, I, we just had this discussion, uh, Dave Sliney and I, with an installation here in Maryland uh, where it was going to double the cost to add ceiling fans to the installation that they were doing. And I argued that you're getting at least a five and maybe tenfold increase in the effectiveness of the UV by doubling the cost. I think it's a good investment. We have a question uh, from Hemant about whether moisture content of a room affects performance. In, in theory, with, that, go ahead. with the with pox viruses, and it definitely has some impact. That in the winter time, we got much better killing of pox viruses than we did in the summertime when the humidity was higher. Yeah, Colorado did work on that as well on uh, increasing humidity tending to to decrease the uh, rate constant for for various uh, pathogens and of course that's opposed to the humidify to reduce infection risk uh, dictum that's been widely uh, disseminated during the pandemic there, there is one study though from uh, from uh, rod escom in, in lima peru where the average humidity over two years was about 70%, and they got about 80% effectiveness uh, with upper room germicidal <laughs> system. Uh, so it, it seems as though a lot of the humidity effect on UV effectiveness may be more of a laboratory phenomenon, but if there is time for um, particles to be killed in the upper room, it, it that study at least suggests yeah. that pretty well. The effect of summer uh, to winter was we reduced the effectiveness from 1,000 air changes an hour to 100 air changes an hour. Still an awful lot. Um, so there's been a number of questions about surfaces and fomites. And I, I, I'm just going to sum it up in one of the, the later ones, which says, what percent of airborne particles reach the upper room system? And what percent of airborne particles land uh, and linger on fomites? Done. Well, I think one of the things you have to think about is not just what percent stay in the air and what land on fomites, but what can you transfer from a surface by touching it to your respiratory mucosa? And what can you deposit in your respiratory tract by breathing? Where does it deposit and how sensitive is the location where it deposits? And we don't know that much yet about how sensitive different locations are for SARS-CoV-2, but we do know well for influenza from human experiments that it takes a single influenza virus to deposit deep in the lung to cause full-blown flu with fever, chills, uh, and systemic symptoms. It takes 100,000 influenza viruses instilled in the nose to cause a mild upper respiratory infection with no fever and no systemic symptoms. And it's almost impossible to cause fever by depositing flu virus just in the nose. So, uh, and, and, and to get humongous doses into your nose by touching a surface, basically it, you would have to simulate what was done in the UVA experiments for transmitting rhinovirus, which they found they couldn't transmit it by touching surfaces, but they could, if somebody sneezed on their hand, it was still wet. The second person rubbed the person's wet hand while it was still wet and then immediately stuck it in their nose. That worked. 
but anything short of that did not work. Oh, hopefully people aren't doing that these days. So thank you. Well, the, the, I worry uh, about that in preschool, but I think after about kindergarten, people stop doing that. <laughs> Take um, your word for it, though. Paul, you'd mentioned fans, and we have a question from Steve saying, uh, may we hear more on the use of low velocity fans? And he specifically highlights the, the quote unquote big ass brand. Yeah, well, obviously I have to be cautious on uh, you know, endorsing any one product, uh, but the, the whole idea of uh, you know, supplementing things with fans is to overcome in many cases, existing ventilation system, which you're, you may be fighting with, it may be the temperature differential. You know, Ed mentioned, uh, you know, the heat and convection coming off of, uh, you know, each little body or big body. Uh, but if you have a poor ventilation system where you're sending heat in all on ceiling, you're going to create this barrier of warm air and you're never, yes, you may have a little bit of mixing in the lower space, but you're not going to be mixing between the, uh, uh, the lower space and the upper space. So we really have to understand you know, uh, if we add fans, which again, I'm a proponent of, of good air mixing. If we add fans, you know, how do we ensure it doesn't interfere with the ventilation system? How can it work to in synergy with the ventilation system? Or if somebody has a ventilation system, is there a way to just change the diffusers and keep the fans on to get the, uh, the air mixing itself over? Thanks, Paul. We have another question. Um, and it's, so the question is from Heidi, and it says, what about in resource poor settings, settings where regular electricity supply is unavailable? Is there any effectiveness in battery supplied UV lights that operate from, for a limited time? For example, end of day airing or UV light disinfection time period. And I just wanna to add to this question, and I think probably a lot of people have this, is you know, what kind of electricity does this run off? Is it just a regular bulb? Can it be run off a generator or batteries? Wow, you just asked a lot of questions. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no. well, the, uh, others may be aware of it. I'm not aware of any uh, you know, battery operated uh, UV lights as, as a package. You know, there are packages where they'll have uh, you know, essentially a, uh, either a generator or a, a battery backup with an inverter to, to run incubators and freezers and whatnot. And you could easily use something uh, for that. The, the energy requirement for these uh, luminaires is not very high. Uh, it's generally, uh, you know, uh, for the U.S. side, it'd be, uh, you know, 110 uh, for voltage. You know, and, and rest of the world, it'll probably be uh, 220, which means you have less amperage. Uh, but, you know, I, I think you'll find that with a simple... Uh, you know, battery system, an inverter and or generator, it would work perfectly fine. And then secondly, we have to take a look at, at fixtures themselves. You may find that some of the more expensive uh, fixtures are even uh, more energy efficient. So you have to balance that with uh, you know, a very uh, inexpensive fixture that has relatively good output. There's, there's one out there that's about 150, 200 US dollars that has half the output of the, the standard ones that are uh, available here in the US. But, you know, it's a 30 watt lamp, so it'll take more energy, but it'll cost you less in the beginning. So when we talk about cost and sustainability, we have to take a look at the life cycle, which is what I was talking about before, over. Uh, Paul, the uh, LEDs would be more likely to be running on uh, DC current and, and uh, battery power or even solar power, right? Yeah, exactly. And the issue with, oh, excuse me, with uh, uh, LEDs right now is that the power, the UVC power coming out of it is so, so minuscule. It's just not quite ready for prime time. But hopefully the LED uh, technology will uh, improve as fast as the regular uh, light UV or uh, LED technology over. So we have a question from Alfredo. He said, thanks for the quality of the information. What to say about, the, what, 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 what do you have to say about the height of the ceiling? Higher ceilings pack less of the virus in the living area and the lower level, um, sorry, than a lower level ceiling. Is this demonstrated experimentally? So really the, the, the volume with respect to the height, does it make a difference to how much is in the lower levels? 
Yeah, I, I think there, there are two questions there and, and I'll uh, uh, lead the second part to, to Ed. If we're talking about an upper room uh, UVC 254 nanometer system, we'll have very little uh, UV down on the surfaces, but you'll have that low level UVC 24 seven. So, you know, there may be uh, limited uh, disinfection of surfaces. And I, I know one group that's finished a study on that. I don't know if Ed knows any others. So, so when we're talking about 254, you know, it's, it's more for the air and less for the surfaces. Uh, 254, one advantage is it is much more penetrating than 222 as far as uh, surfaces and even airborne particles. You can have airborne particles that are covered with a lot of gook, to use a technical term. And uh, it may be that 254 can't penetrate to the uh, virons or the bacteria inside that droplet. And Ed, if you want to talk about 222, that might be a good uh, lead in. Uh, okay, I, I was just going to say that I, I think with high ceilings, uh, I, I'm not sure, you know, about uh, the transmission of, of, of the virus per se. Don may have something to say about that. Dilution is great uh, in, in very large auditoriums, for example, you'd be have something that is begins to resemble outside. Um, but um, in terms of dosing upper room germicidal UV uh, or the effectiveness, uh, I think you have tremendous advantages with high ceilings to have very long ray length, very simple fixtures that irradiate a large amount of the a higher percentage of the volume, if you will, of, of a room. So in theory, upper, uh, high ceilings are very um, conducive to uh, irradiating large volumes of air and producing good air disinfection in the lower room. We may have to adjust the dosing strategies a little bit, and there's limited information about that because the studies I showed you, for example, are in, were in rooms with nine, 10 foot ceilings, and we have not done studies in rooms with 20 foot ceilings, for example, but CFD, uh, computational fluid dynamics can help there. What Paul just referred to, of course, is, is 222 um, direct whole room irradiation. And there, again, uh, one could uh, put UV in the upper, high up in the ceiling and basically irradiate a lot of the air in the room with less concern about air mixing because of the fact that you are do really treating all of the air in the room in that way. We don't have good studies of that in actual applications. And again, this technology is only now becoming um, more widely available. Uh, it is theoretically very safe and theoretically very effective, as effective as 254 in terms of killing virus. But we don't really have as many studies to look at in different room configurations, for example. You guys, I. Um... I want to be mindful of everyone's time. We were supposed to end at 10:30, and it's 10:36. Um, I think maybe we could we could uh, end with with one uh, last question. Um, somebody has written: Is are there is there data? It's, there's lots of great questions. So I'm sorry, I'm just choosing a random one from the bottom of the list. But is there any data for the cost of these control measures over time? Something to compare the total cost of ownership, including equipment and installation costs, utility costs, consumable costs and maintenance of different technologies. I just want to add, it's not part of the question, but I think as we've seen SARS and MERS and H1N1 and, and now you know SARS-CoV-2 uh, viruses over time, it, it, if we want to keep the public space safe, we're going to want to be able to keep these things available over time. So so what do you guys think? Is it you know is there a cost that somebody has measured this over time? Yeah, I, I think if uh, people go to the second last slide in my presentation, and, and uh, you folks can explain about how to access the, uh, the PDFs of the presentations. But the second to last slide of my presentation has a link to the Stop TV partnership uh, out of Geneva. And there's one document in there that was actually the one on the left in that slide <clears throat> that has a table in there uh, about life cycle costs and gives some, some estimates. You know, obviously some things are ranges, uh, but it would give you a feel for uh, what, what the life cycle cost will be, including initial costs along the way for electricity and capital costs from uh, uh, the fixture, installing it and whatnot. So, so you can probably uh, adjust those numbers for your uh, area, but at least give you a ballpark and also shows economies of scale. Over. <laughs>
Okay, well, thank you, Paul. And thank you to all the speakers. You know, it's just amazing to have people who have worked on this area for so uh, many years come together. And you can see that there's, you, it's very hard to capture what's probably 150 years of, of learning and working in one hour. Uh, but I wanna thank our speakers for sharing so much with us today. I wanna share, I wanna thank the participants uh, for just uh, being here. And of course, the great questions. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Hopefully we're gonna be putting more and more material on our, on our websites and please, please feel free to, to write to us um, uh, you know, as, you, uh, uh, as you have questions and we'll try and answer them. So thank you very much. I wish everyone a good rest of the day and uh, hopefully we'll be able to use this technology. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.